as he maintains a fast-paced sprint through the final months of his second term as Arkansas governor. Asa Hutchinson is reflecting and looking to the future, a future for his state, including a vision for Arkansas to become a worldwide hub for advanced mobility and computer science education, a future for his political career. Yes, that's right, I ask about rumors of presidential ambitions. In the next 30 minutes, we'll reflect on Governor Hutchinson's almost two terms leading our state, including navigating the implications of an unexpected pandemic and serving during a rough and tumble political climate. He also reflected on his childhood and early law career, which started right here in downtown Bentonville. Governor Hutchinson, thank you so much for joining us this morning here at Louise. I'm glad to be with you today. It's always uh, great to be in Bentonville. And you were born in Bentonville. I was born in the Bentonville Hospital a mm -hmm. long time ago. I lived over in Gravit mm -hmm. uh, on a farm, but obviously we went to the Bentonville Hospital. And, uh, and so there, and then uh, when I finished law school, I came back to uh, practice law in Bentonville with uh, Judge Jim Hendren, who was not a judge at that time, but practice law in the square of Bentonville. So Bentonville roots are deep in me. I wanna go back just a little bit. Uh, in prepping for this interview, I asked some people about you, and I heard a lot about, ask him about all the adventures he had growing up between Gravit and Bentonville, oh. hunting and, and being <laughs> out in the open. I heard you had fascinating stories. So do you have one that you could share? Well, actually, um, whenever I was in Gravit, my mom and dad moved to Springdale, and mm -hmm. we missed the farm and the mm -hmm. country. And so we would actually skip school over in Springdale. Don't tell anybody that. And We're not advocating for skipping school. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'd go back to Gravit and Sulphur Springs to go cave exploring mm -hmm. in the Popcorn Cave. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, we it was it was the uh, outdoors. And of course, we came over to Bentonville for uh, you know all kinds of shopping activities, the mm -hmm. courthouse and everything. But love the outdoors here and camping. Uh, hiking, uh, but it was just just living mm -hmm. uh, in uh, what we see now is such a beautiful territory. It is, and you've spent some time in downtown Bentonville um, early in your law career, correct? Oh, very much so. Uh, so Bentonville is uh, where my wife and I uh, first had our home mm -hmm. and uh, had my law office there uh, off the square and uh, of course, we had our home on Second Street, uh, right under the water tower. Oh downtown. yeah, we know. okay. And so that was our home. We bought it for eleven thousand dollars, fully furnished. Uh, we got the loan from the Bank of Bentonville and Ed Buck, and uh, there was no appraisal required. It was simply a walk around, and he was happy with it. It was just a different day in banking. Uh, and then practice law on the square, you know, just walking from the law office over to the courthouse, Judge Enfield uh, swore me in as a young lawyer. I was the city attorney of Bentonville mm -hmm. uh, for a couple of years. And then I actually uh, moved out of Bentonville uh, to a double wide mobile home okay. uh, on 15 acres. It was an old rabbit farm. And it was between uh, Bentonville and Pea Ridge. Okay. And uh, it's where you have the uh, radio tower out there today. But some of the happiest moments of our lives were on that 15 acres. You had blackberries and raspberries that our kids picked. Mm -hmm. Simple life, but I we'd had a, built a fence, had some cattle out there. Just had a wonderful time for the, through those years. Now you mentioned radio tower. This is something I didn't know about you, but you and your brother started the first radio station in Bentonville. Uh, that's right. It was Bentonville's first FM radio, FM radio station. FM radio station. And so we actually got the license uh, from mm -hmm. the FCC. Uh, the location was the 15 acre rabbit farm. <laughs> it just worked Thus out the tower. perfectly. Okay. And uh, it's incredible to start a business from scratch, a little bit of an entrepreneurial mm -hmm. side of me and to put the tower up and uh, have to sell advertising. And it was a great experience and uh, uh, good memories of, of people being attached to the music of the station mm -hmm. and the programming. You know, I ultimately sold it, but uh, 
great experience in business, and I think it reflects uh, the entrepreneurial spirit that we have in Northwest Arkansas. It's very strong here. Now, quick question. Were you ever on air? Were you a DJ, or did you do the, the behind the scenes? Oh, it was behind the scenes. <laughs> I was an owner, uh, manager, but I did a little bit on the air. But no, I, I was not a broadcast uh, person, mm -hmm. uh, but I was practicing law. I mean, that's what I did. And, you know, during that time, uh, you know, I was a young lawyer, uh, and so I did a lot of real estate work. Mm -hmm. uh, I did anything that walked in the door because that's how I made my living and just a wonderful experience. Even today, I have people come up and say, you know, you did my the will for my mom or, uh, you know, you did this contract for our property. They remember me practicing law in Bentonville and very good memories. Now, I'm going to take a big jump because we do have a limited amount of time and we want to talk about your time as Arkansas governor. I was listening to your, your new podcast and something stuck out at me. It was just a, a passing comment that you made uh, that seven years ago, you went to Silicon Valley to recruit businesses, especially tech businesses to come to Arkansas and Northwest Arkansas, and, and they weren't super interested. And then you mentioned now that those doors are opening, that there's a lot of excited businesses about coming here to our state. What moved the needle in seven years? And there's a lot of things. We're going to go through all of them. Uh, correct. And, mm -hmm. and it's just dramatic change. I mean, I went to Silicon Valley and, and uh, I wanted to recruit businesses and they just drooled and said, no, we're not coming to Arkansas, but we'll sure take your talent right. and move them out there. <laughs> And I said, that's not going to work. And so we started growing our technology businesses mm -hmm. here in this state so that our young people with a computer science education has a has a place to uh, where they love to live uh, mm -hmm. to work. And we've been successful in that. But uh, so what changed? We emphasize computer science education. And mm -hmm. so the nation recognizes the talent that we're producing in that field. Uh, secondly, COVID happened. Uh, that all of a sudden people started working remotely, a greater investment in high-speed broadband. Uh, and, and so all of those factors combined uh, made Arkansas a much more attractive place for technology companies to come. But here in Northwest Arkansas, uh, the emphasis upon bringing those tech companies here uh, has really made a difference. And we've set up an environment, an ecosystem in which tech companies can foster and grow here. Uh, exciting time for the tech growth in Northwest Arkansas. We know something about growing businesses here in Northwest Arkansas. We've got that spirit. Something else you did was you formed the Arkansas Council on Future Mobility, and that really focuses on those electric vehicles, the uh, driverless vehicles like the company Gaddick, um, drone delivery, cars that travel by air. Uh, this is the future. This is cool stuff being made and, and um, innovations right here in, in Northwest Arkansas and in Arkansas. Can you speak a little bit about, about that? Arkansas has always led in transportation. Mm -hmm. And of course, Northwest Arkansas with our, with Walmart, with J.B. Hunt, I mean, it's all about the supply chain, logistics, it's transportation. So we have led in transportation, but if you want to lead in the future, you have to move to technology. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to be a technology company. And so, we created this uh, future council on mobility uh, to look at you know what are the barriers that stop us from going to drone delivery or to autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles how can we open up those doors more and northwest arkansas with uh, gaddick being here and autonomous vehicle piloting and uh, you've got uh, drone delivery uh, the doors wide open and we're being recognized nationally as uh, being the leader in innovation in the uh, supply chain, the logistics. Mm -hmm. We got to stay on that cutting edge. That's why this council is there. And I expect a report by the end of October. And uh, we'll be able to uh, launch uh, changes from that that are needed. We want to talk about creating a workforce also that can you know, support these kind of tech jobs that come in. And a lot of that has been your focus on computer science here in Arkansas. Can you speak a little bit? To, are we prepared to bring in those kind of companies and how do we support that here? We are prepared to bring mm -hmm. them in, but we have to enhance our education, our training mm -hmm. from everything from uh, 
the te technological skills to manage IT systems, to cybersecurity, uh, to data analytics, all of those things are a critical part of having the workforce. And so whether it's robotics training or whether it's the uh, data analytics uh, part of the puzzle, cybersecurity, we've got to train more aggressively, more broadly, and more intensely. So it's a high school initiative, uh, but it's also what we're doing in the lower grades. Uh, but then it's also what happens at the University of Arkansas uh, to enhance uh, those uh, advanced degrees that are critical. If we're not producing computer science engineers, then we're not going to be able to be on the cutting edge in the future. So we're working very hard to keep up, catch up, mm -hmm. uh, and to make sure that we're uh, ready for the future. I want to shift a little bit to your experiences navigating the COVID pandemic. Um, Arkansas came away pretty well positioned on the back end of this pandemic. Um, we have record low unemployment. We have more jobs than pre-pandemic levels. What did we do right in this state to position us so well? Well, a couple of things we did right. Uh, one, we didn't make a, a difference between an essential business and a non-essential business. A pressure from all over the country to say essential businesses can operate, non-essential businesses need to shelter in place. It didn't make any sense to me because every business that creates a job is an essential business. And so we kept our businesses open. Uh, we counted on them to put the protective measures in place, but we kept our economy moving. But secondly, we kept our schools open. And that was a tough decision because in uh, the uh, fall of 2020, a lot of pressure, cases were going up, and uh, no one wanted to go back to school, but we knew we had to have in-classroom instruction. And as a result of that today, everybody looks back and say, keeping schools open were really important, and closing schools hurt the mental health mm -hmm. of our students, uh, hurt the ad academic advancement. And so Arkansas, through the pandemic, was number two in terms of days in the classroom for our students. I'm very proud of that. And I think those are a couple of things we did right, challenging times, but uh, as a result of keeping our economy open, we recovered much more quickly. People are working today. As a mother of two kids, keeping those kids in school is important to me. So I'm also very proud of that. I was not a good virtual teacher, and so I'm glad they were in the classroom. Um, you know, as, as the leader of our state, but you know, also as an Arkansan, what kept you up at night navigating that pandemic? We all had those things. We, we didn't sleep well for a while there because it was a little scary. What, what were the things that you really were worried about? The sufficiency of our healthcare system mm -hmm. is what I worried most about. Whether it's hospital space, whether it's nursing shortages, whether it was uh, them mentally wearing out of having to treat COVID patients over two and a half years. Uh, those were stresses on our system that we weren't prepared for, the nation wasn't prepared for, and they were such heroes. And I look at my challenges, but you think about the, the doctors and the nurses, uh, they've just been extraordinary and uh, went through a lot. And uh, it's going to take a little while for us to recover uh, from the stress on that system. Uh, but we made some good decisions in terms of anticipating uh, where the shortages were, putting a lot of money uh, into keeping our hospitals and expanding the space there. And so you never saw us run into shortages like you saw in New York and other places. Uh, we uh, managed our healthcare system where it, everybody had a bed, everybody had the treatment that they needed, even though it was a very stressful time. It was a stressful time. I, I'm throwing in a question here. Um, you don't know what's coming. It's not, a, it's not a gotcha question, but we see a lot of division right now in the country. We all are, are watching it on the news. And I saw a quote um, that you had in Civilian Ma uh, Magazine, and I'm going to paraphrase it. Going back to our founding fathers, politics has been rough and tumble. We've never had the intensity of division that we have right now. And what we have to do is listen to each other and look for common ground. Um, I like that because it does contrast the time with our founding fathers, which was also very... Um, like you said, rough and tumble. Is that achievable? And if so, what are those first steps in, in uniting the country again? 
Well, I'll emphasize the point as to how rough it's been. I've been reading yeah. about George Washington and he mm -hmm. had people in his administration that was undermining him mm -hmm. and criticizing him anonymously. So it's tough. The difference is that today you have all of the criticism and the drama of politics magnified by the internet, by social media. Mm -hmm. And that has changed politics, not for the good. And so what we have to do is one, realize that that person on the other side that you might be talking about on the internet or social media is a real human being. And whenever you realize the humanness of others, then it causes you to you know, pull back a little bit. It causes you to be more compassionate and understanding and to listen more. And so we just gotta think that through. Listening is very, very important. And whenever you listen, you always find a grain of things that you can agree upon. A lot of differences, not gonna change that, not gonna change your principles. But I hope that we can listen more and find ways that we can work together. It takes leaders to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen naturally. We gotta show our kids that there's humans on the other end of that computer, that we we need to learn how to get along. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, exactly, and it's not much different than we don't want our kids bullying in the school. No. Well. Let's set the example, but not bullying. <laughs> Keyboard warriors, right. Um, over the last few weeks, we've seen some headlines um, touting a possible run for, for high office. Um, you were in New Hampshire in April at the Politics and Eggs event. Um, there's headlines, Time Magazine, Arkansas Governor Asa Hutchinson says a 2024 presidential bid is on the table. If I were a betting person, will I see you in Iowa soon, perhaps? Well, I hope so. Actually, that's one of my goals. I want to get to Iowa uh -huh. this year. This part of testing the waters. I've been to mm -hmm. New Hampshire, uh, but it really comes back to growing up in Bentonville, where people cared about mm -hmm. our country, uh, cared about uh, the direction and our families and our community. And if you care, then you want to be engaged. And particularly when you think you have a unique voice and that you can help bring people together. So. Uh, I want to enjoy life. I want to enjoy the, the ride, but also want to make a difference every day. So we'll see where this leads. But Bentonville will be a big part of my future mm -hmm. uh, because when I finish my time as governor, Susan and I will be back home. We've got grandchildren here. We love this community, and uh, we'll see where it leads from a national perspective. So no announcements yet, uh, but we'll uh, stay tuned. Uh, like, <laughs> stay tuned. Stay tuned. Speaking of stay tuned, final question. Um, well, you started a podcast called Fast Break with Asa, and the description says the topics are foreign policy, economic development, and basketball strategy. <laughs> um, you take time out of every week to, to play a pickup game. You love basketball, but this podcast is also a great way to communicate with people and tell them what's next with you. So speak a little bit about the basketball. You've played all over the world. Well, I have. Not professionally, but pick up games. I can say I'm an international basketball player, even though it's simply pick up games yeah. I've played everywhere. <laughs> it's become a tradition. And so mm -hmm. I have uh, enjoyed that uh, opportunity to build relationships through basketball. But I love to play uh, full court basketball. We do it uh, every week. And uh, so we started this podcast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, people see me as sort of a, a straight laced uh, person who's uh, interested in public affairs, but I have a lot of fun in life. And so mm -hmm. I want people to see a little bit more relaxed atmosphere uh, in talking about important issues, but at the same time, uh, having some fun along the way. So it's Fast Break with Asa mm -hmm. and uh, stay tuned. We'll have some interesting guests on there. You did mention on your podcast that sometimes you like to goof off. So it does give this like balance of, you know, policy and uh, things about government and then also fun at the same time. You got to have that fun. Uh, I do like to goof off. That's what keeps you fresh yep. and uh, balanced in life. And my wife's very good at making sure <laughs> there's a humble streak in there. She keeps you grounded. Well, and so do the grandkids, I'm assuming. Oh, they keep you yeah. busy and active. Well, of course, I've got grandkids that, that uh, you know, play basketball. They play tennis. Of mm -hmm. course, they have got uh, two of them that played at Bentonville High School. Mm -hmm. So they keep you young. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon in Bentonville. Uh, I'll count on it. Yeah. That's all the time we have. Thanks for watching. I do have a quick viewer note for you. Downtown Now will be switching our airtime here on the same station, KNWA. Starting in June, you'll find us Saturdays at 5 p.m.
In the meantime, we encourage you to shop, eat, and play in our beautiful downtown, and we'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode produced by the community nonprofit Downtown Bentonville Inc. Our team works year round to build and promote a welcoming and lively Downtown Bentonville through experiences, education, and storytelling. Last year, as events were put on hold in our region, Downtown Bentonville Inc. launched Downtown Media, a community supported, community driven storytelling platform. You can see our videos on social media before movies at Skylight and right here on KNWA. If you would like to learn more about DBI and Downtown Media or be featured in one of our storytelling projects or support us in an upcoming year, please visit downtownbentonville.org.